give Angela plenty of time to, to share. Um, thank you all for joining us. We have Angela Hahn here with us. Um, hopefully most of you are probably familiar with her. She's um, a practicing attorney and she has her own podcast and her own, um, I know life coaching business and there's a number of other um, things and has a really um, big social media following. And she's also taught yoga for us at a couple of times at our in-person programs, but we're really excited to be able to have Angela here and to focus on avoiding burnout with us today. So I will um, turn this over to Angela. If you have questions, please go ahead and use the chat and put those in the chat. Angela will hope hopefully at the end be able to um, respond to some of you and maybe take you we'll get you off mute um, to have some interaction but Angela will use the the time she needs to go ahead and present and address questions at the end thanks Angela thank you thank you um trying to get myself situated here so I have the chat open as well next to my presentation here so, okay, thank you so much for attending. Um, the first thing I want to do is uh, I want to encourage you to share your LinkedIn profile and uh, share, share a link to your, to your profile. And bonus challenge is to connect with at least two other people that you're not yet connected with, connected with because after all, this is a, this is a, a, a networking week and, and it says strength through adversity. And so I think we're stronger together. And so if you get a chance, to uh, go get your, like, grab your LinkedIn profile, share it in the comments. And again, don't forget to switch to panelists and attendees so that everybody can see your comments. Um, and then we can just get the ball rolling here. Um, and if you're like, you know, I don't know if my, my LinkedIn profile is like already, uh, it, I don't know if it's perfect. I don't know if it's like good enough. Uh, it's very old, blah, blah, blah. It's totally fine if you don't have the perfect profile because in my profile photo, I don't even have any makeup on. So uh, if that goes to show anything, there's there's no real requirement on <laughs> how good your profile looks. So um, actually, I have uh, one of my teammates, Lulu, here. So Lulu, if you could share my LinkedIn profile in the comments to in the chat so that we can just start us off, that would be awesome. Um, OK, I don't see any links yet. I'm just trusting, yay, Lori, <laughs> we are going to grab our links. Um, so I'm very excited to be, to be connected with you. All right. So who is this presentation for? Like, are you even in the right place? Is this going to be helpful? Um, so he, I want to ask you to also type in the chat, which one do you resonate with the most of these bullet points, right? Because you might feel like, oh, um, there's just so much work. Um, and even if there's not a lot of work, you might feel mentally tired or exhausted and you don't know if you're in the right job. You don't know if you're getting enough work. What does the future hold for you? And you just have trouble getting very simple things done too. And so you're not sure, uh, if, if, if you're even, uh, burnt out, like, because if I'm just having trouble with like really simple stuff, am I really burnt out? So if any of these things actually resonate with you, you are in the right place, okay? Okay, let me tell you exactly what we're gonna cover because everybody likes to say uh, burnout is about burning the midnight oil. It's about working 24 seven. And that's the message that we're told that we must be working all the time to qualify calling ourselves burnt out. That is not true. Burnout is about not being able to use your time and your energy effectively. And what I want to share today is that there are at least four different types of burnout. And we're going to talk about how knowing what kind of burnout you have can work in your favor and help you make the change that you need to make to have lasting results. Identifying is key. And people also like to say, okay, well, if you're burnt out, you got to ask for help. And the question is, what kind of help is the right kind of help? We're going to cover all of that stuff in this hour. So what I want you to do, what I encourage you to do is formulate your own action plan or even just one action item that you want to implement this week. Okay. So I told you what I'm going to do. And there's one thing I want to ask from you. And what I want to ask you to do is keep an open mind. Maybe some of the, these things you've already heard, maybe you haven't. 
Maybe it's something that you already know, but you've heard it in a different way, so you can implement it in a different way. So what I would like you to uh, ask yourself is, how does this apply to me? Rather than, how does this not apply to me? How am I the exception, right? So that's what I would like to get from you. All right, so why should you even listen to me? This is my family on the right corner. Um, that's when my 15 month old, and that she's now 15 months old, but she just turned one in March. Um, she looks like she's about, she's about to yawn or sneeze or something, but uh, I look good in it. So I just <laughs> chose this photo. Um, and I'm also an in-house counsel at a company called Health for Heritage. It's a SNF ALIL staffing company headquartered in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm also a life coach for lawyers because I graduated from law school without a job. And when I did find a job, I was so burnt out that I was really disillusioned. After wanting to be a lawyer for the longest time, I was like, wait, wait, this doesn't feel right. So I went on an expedition for answers and I learned that even if you feel disillusioned now or uncomfortable now, it is possible to have a job that works for you and live a life that works for you too. And as part of my search for answers, I started my podcast, Fit to Practice, to talk to lawyers all over the world on their journey and how they dealt with their burnout. And it's been, I'm so happy to report that it's been over two years and I've just hit 20,000 downloads, which I, I choose to be proud about <laughs> because it's so easy to look at other people's podcasts and like they're 2 million downloads, but I feel like this is a milestone. And fun fact, if you see in the middle, there's like this weird photo of my hands and a bunch of cards. Fun fact about myself, I was debating whether I should share this, but I'm like, well, if, 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 it's, it's, a, if it's a bunch of lawyers who are open-minded about learning how to be not burnt out, I feel like they're going to be open-minded about this. These cards are tarot cards. I know how to read them. So if you're into that kind of stuff, hit me up later. All right, let's start with identifying what even is burnout. Again, burnout means something is off. Something is misaligned. Thanks, thanks, Lori. So you can't really do the work that you need to do at the most effective level. And so as we, as we go through each type of burnout, think about where you see yourself in each of these quadrants. Maybe you see yourself in one of them, two of them, more of them whatever it is, right? You don't have to fit in one box, like literally. Okay, so what do these four types of burnout even mean? When we look at involuntary overworking, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty self-explanatory, right? When you're involuntarily overworking, you're on, on call 24 seven, you feel paralyzed, you can't make, make plans, you feel really stuck physically and mentally. And when you're voluntarily overworking, you're you might be responding to non-urgent emails or doing non-urgent tasks after hours or just in times where it's just not necessary. And when it's involuntary or underworking, it's where you're, you feel like you're not given enough work. You're underutilized and so you feel anxious. You're always doubting, okay, am I growing enough? Do I need to switch jobs? What do I need to do? And there's a voluntary underworking where um, this seems like a really simple task. I've done this for the longest time, but I just can't get myself to do the work. And that also is known as procrastination. And so we're going to tackle all, all four of these. And again, you're not defined by any of these boxes. And it could be a combination where you work long hours, but you don't produce the, the, the right results, et cetera. And it also applies to other things too, like in relationships, you could be voluntarily overworking, like doing the work, doing the work, trying to be good, but you're so burnt out because you feel like the relationship is not improving. Or you could be involuntarily underworking where it's like you're not kind of on the same coin, like you're not given enough opportunity to show the, the value that you have to offer to the other person. And I wanna tell you that there's opportunity in all of them. And so it's okay if you identify with at least one of them. Okay, how do we get started? I wanna start with our foundational model, the be, do, have model. And let me explain. 
So we all want to be people who are not burnt out. We want to be that person who is not burnt out. But it feels like we need to have the perfect job, the perfect hours, the perfect boss, the perfect colleagues to have that, that total burnout-free zone, that burnout-free life. But each of us can testify to how difficult and pretty much impossible that is. Sometimes we're burnt out and we feel like there's literally nothing we can do. But what I want to share is that we can be fulfilled before we even lift a finger. Okay, I know it sounds like we're putting the cart before the horse, but we can make that decision first to be fulfilled. So if you take a look at what you want to be instead and decide to be that, you are it. And now that we are that person, what are the actions, thoughts, and the behaviors that correspond with that person, that role, that position? And soon the opportunities that align with that role, whether it's a promotion, whether it's another job, another company, or whatever that might be, whatever that looks like to you, will come to you because the right people will say, oh, that is the kind of person I want on my team. Here's the thing. Most people live under the have, do, be model. Like they say, I need to have the perfect surroundings and the perfect circumstances and the perfect experiences in order to do the kind of work that I want to do so that I can be the role and the work and do the work on my own terms. So what we end up doing is chasing experience and perfection before moving on to the next step of the doing. So the question I want to ask is, what if I'm already in the role that I want to be at? For example, what if I am that expert lawyer who is not burnt out? What are the core qualities that make that kind of person? Someone who is okay with making mistakes. Someone who is okay with mistakes of other people. Someone who looks at the big picture and focuses on taking care of themselves so that they can make important decisions then being that person means doing as that person. We do in a way that we learn how to be okay with our mistakes and learn from them instead of being anxious about it. We learn how to look at the big picture so that you know what the most helpful action items are for yourself, your firm, your company, your organization. And you do as that person by actually taking care of yourself in a way that makes sense for you. So when you're already being the cool, calm, collected, confident leader that you want to be, then others notice. And it's only a matter of time when you actualize that in reality in your life. Okay. So this is the foundational model. And we're going to look at each what type of the, each type of burnout and think about how we can address each of them. <clears throat> All right, first is involuntary overworking. Step number one. By the way, please uh, please write down any questions or, or thoughts or whatever that comes up to you as you're, as you're sort of going through this. If you're like, okay, that part is confusing. Can you re-share re, re that or whatever? Um, please feel free to let me know anytime. <clears throat> okay, how to address voluntary overworking. Um, your step number one, understand that overworking is not always bad. You're working many hours, but at some point you feel like you need rest. Like you're okay with working over, uh, over time. Like you feel like, yes, you're doing all the work because you really like it, but you just wish that you could spend a bit of time actually resting properly. And, and then you also wonder like, okay, what is the right way to rest, right? And then you, you really want to do other things that give you a break and helps you perform better too. So you're always kind of thinking, okay, what really is the best way to rest? And I don't really know how to rest. So why don't I just keep working? Because I don't know how to rest <laughs> because I actually like doing the work that I want to do right now. So when there are days when overworking makes sense, know that that's okay, 
right? So other people can always say like, oh my gosh, why are you working so much? Why are you working on Sunday? Why are you working after seven o'clock? Why? But don't let that be a litmus test for how you judge yourself. Don't let the other people's judgment of what overworking means affect what overworking means to you. So when you're like in a place of, oh my gosh, am I work? Am I overworking? Am I working too much? That leads to anxiety. And that does not align with being the person who is not burnt out. A person who is not burnt out is okay when things are not perfect. And so then they then are able to cut out all the noise and focus on the task at hand. And so once you understand that there is no right or wrong answer and it's okay, whatever you're doing, then we move on to step two. Decide how much you find yourself at the optimal working level by looking at where you are producing the best results and when you're producing the best results. And so when you're so enthusiastic about working so much, you might not have noticed that you're still going at it when you're rubbing your eyes and yawning at whatever o'clock at night and you're not really putting out your best work. And you also might feel like you, you might also notice later on that you're being a perfectionist, working on the same email the whole day. So notice this. Notice when you've moved past your peak performance by looking at the results that you're producing and make a decision on the best place to shift away from the work so that you can show up again the next day so that you're focusing on the results and not making the amount of time and the energy that you spend mean that, uh, mean that that's, that's uh, who you are and how much you're worth. Like don't let the amount of time and energy correspond with your worth as, um, as an employee, as a lawyer, as whoever you are at work. Exactly, exactly, Lori. And like, that's exactly what happens to me. Everybody, people, people are like, like, why are you working so hard? I'm like, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do. This is what I enjoy. But I do know that sometimes I do crave that space where I'm like totally shut off. And so that's, that's what I want to address here. And so when you do crave a few more hours, here's what I want you to do. Audit your time by creating a, a wheel or a spreadsheet. The actual to, tool that you use, it doesn't matter. You can even write line by line what, how you use your time. For example, what time your alarm went off? Like if it went off at, I don't know, six o'clock and when do you actually wake up? <laughs> do you wake up at 6.05 or 6.55? And what time to what time did you uh, take that walk? Was it seven to seven fifteen or seven to seven fifty five again? And then also, this is the most painful part, you guys. Time on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, social media, whatever. Take a look at that. And so, when you write down every single line, how much time you've used on what, it's really, really eye opening. That you might not have realized that you actually take 55 minutes not getting out of bed. And I say you, but I'm talking about me. This actually happened to me. And when I looked at, oh my gosh, like 55 minutes, that's like a whole like lunch hour, right? And so when you put that out there on paper, it becomes powerless, right? <laughs> yeah, I was so like, I like, I'm, I, I totally relate to you, Priya, because I was, um, I thought I was watching YouTube for like 10 minutes. And then I looked at the time and it was like an hour and a half. And I'm like, that is impossible. That is impossible. But apparently that's, that's just how it happens. So exactly, exactly, Valerie. So auditing your time alone will allow you to already create at least an additional hour of the day. So even just that YouTube example, right? Um, but if you, but, but you might be looking into getting um, more time. Like, you know what? I kind of want to watch YouTube. <laughs> I kind of want to stay on social media um, because it helps you feel connected. Or you might be like, well, I cut an hour from my social media or I cut an hour from whatever, but I kind of still need more time. And so here's what I want to suggest if you're up to it. Of course, I mean, all of this is optional, but this is something that has worked for me and I'll tell you why. Step four, consider one thing that you want to delegate. 
And it doesn't necessarily have to be paid. And it doesn't have to be about you ordering other people what to do. Like if families around you, or if you have neighbors, if kids a similar age, and this is something that we've all been exposed to or experienced um, if we have family or neighbors with kids of a similar age, right? So for example, what's a win-win situation like carpooling or hiring a sitter and all of these things, I know that we're so, still transitioning out of the pandemic and these are still, so these are things that you might wanna consider. Okay, what is it that I want to benefit from? Is it better that I hire somebody or would I rather be doing that myself? So if you're prepared to invest money into it, I know that it might feel uncomfortable, even when you make the decision, you know what, I really have to hire somebody. I really need to hire a babysitter. I really need to hire whatever. But look at where you're already delegating and see the benefits it offers. I mean, we delegate all the time, like DoorDash, Amazon, like we don't go to the manufacturer to get our, our, our beautiful China set. We go to lawyers, even if, if, if we are lawyers ourselves, we've used lawyers before for maybe trusts, wills, whatever that might be, because we're not going to go in and look at all the, 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 the state laws for, for how, to write, <laughs> how to write a trust. If we're not a trust lawyer, if we're not a tr trust real estate lawyer, we will ask somebody else to do it because they're, they do it every day. And the reason we do that is we get the comfort, the peace, and the time. So here's my example. Over the past several months, my husband and I were, you know, back to back, tossing around our 15 month old daughter like a hot poopy potato, not giving her the time and the attention that she deserved. And what we realized is that she is the victim here. So when we decided to hire someone, it was a process. It was not perfect. We didn't find the right sitter on the first try. But when we did, we got back so much time and energy. And not only that, we gave our daughter more time and attention from somebody who was right for her. So look at where you want more of this comfort, peace, and time and how it benefits everybody and is worth the cost. And it start with, starts with not being afraid to depend on others because you know that you deserve the comfort, peace, and time. Um, for no reason, like you don't need a reason to deserve all of that, right? Okay, and I'm gonna be real here. If you are tolerating a suboptimal set of circumstances or conditions, you're telling yourself, you're telling the universe, but more importantly yourself, that you deserve those suboptimal conditions. And so those suboptimal conditions perpetuate. So you're actually perpetuating those circumstances when you're not addressing them. Just like my daughter, I was just perpetuating the, the energy drain, the time drain, because I was telling myself, oh, I don't deserve to be relieved of mom duty. And so when I did that, when I was telling myself, I don't deserve it, I kept suffering. So I want, I want you to consider that when you're thinking about, okay, is this worth the investment? Next up is voluntary underworking, also known as procrastination. And here's the thing. When it comes to procrastination, we know that time is not the issue. It's the energy in general um, that is, not, it's also the energy in general that is not the issue. You just need energy for particular tasks at work that feels monumental, even when you know that it's not, even when you feel like it shouldn't be. And I, I, I really, I really, if you are not aware yet, I really want you to know, this does not mean that you are lazy. And I don't want you to just know this. I want you to completely embody this. It just means that there's something else going on in the subconscious that is driving your actions. 5% of your brain is at the conscious level and 95% of your brain is the subconscious. That's why when people say consciously, oh yeah, I'm gonna work out, I'm gonna eat healthy, they might not end up doing it because their subconscious brain is telling them they're not capable of doing it 
of past experiences and feelings. They're not deserving. They're not worthy of the results that they're looking for. That's an example. So our subconscious is the one that's informing not our words, but our actions. So let's take a look at what's actually going on in our subconscious when we're procrastinating. We start simple, start very simple. Because here's what I noticed from, I've, I've worked with over a hundred lawyers now. And so many people say that they're burnt out or tired or feel unmotivated, but they never really, really say exactly what's happening when I when they when we first talk. They just say, you know, I just I don't feel good. I don't, I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm not motivated. And I feel like something's wrong with me. They never tell me what exactly they're procrastinating on. Could be an email, could be inputting your hours if you work for a firm could be talking to a colleague, whatever that might be. It might feel simple, but you feel like it's so big. So step two is about being as specific as possible when it is embarrassing. And actually, especially if it's embarrassing, because when you put your thoughts down on paper, it becomes powerless. And you know exactly what you're dealing with not just a general feeling of not feeling very good. Okay, so you have everything written down. I know that we don't have time to actually write them down and it's okay if you can't think of it right away. It, this is not something that we can you know, do on the spot. And I know that it's kind of painful because as lawyers, we feel like we need the answers ASAP and we need the answers uh, that are correct. But when it comes to taking care of ourselves, right? That's where we need to step out and know that we don't need the answers right away. We don't need the answers that are always correct. And so that's part of the self-care process, right? And when we do that, we're able to show up in our lawyer hats in a better way because we have taken the time to take care of ourselves and forgive ourselves for not knowing the right answers right away. Okay, now that we know how to do it, not the actual answers, step three. Think about where these habits are coming from, whether it's years ago or weeks ago, and write down an experience that you remember that has fueled your beliefs. And let me give you an example here. I remember as a child, I would always get yelled at for not cleaning out after myself. I would just kind of put things everywhere. And what happened was that I felt unworthy every time I got that kind of criticism whether it was from my parents or some, some other adult. So even after I grew up, I would always procrastinate cleaning my desk or putting away the laundry because every thought, time I thought about cleaning or organizing, my subconscious was telling me, you're not good at it. You're never going to be good at it. And you're never going to be good enough, period. Now, I'm still working on this subconscious belief, right? Which shows that old beliefs die hard or hard, are hard to die. <laughs> but I make progress because I'm stepping into that identity. I'm retraining my subconscious. I'm no longer trying to be that old self who is hurt by comments like that. I'm trying to be the kind of person who cleans because I'm worthy. Not because I need to prove that I'm worthy. I already am. There's nothing I, do, I need to do. There's no condition attached to my worth. So once you've written down some experiences like this, it could be one, it could be many. Think about what you want your new beliefs to be. So my new belief here with, the, with the me being messy is that I'm, I'm starting to clean for myself. Again, not to prove to others that I'm clean, but because I'm worthy of being clean. So if I'm already worthy first, I am being worthy first, which is why I do as someone who is worthy because I am worthy of a clean desk and a clean room. So going back to the being, you are being someone who is not burnt out because you are being worthy. And what you do as a result of being worthy is a result of the fact 
that you're worthy. Okay. And there was a lot of worthy worthies there. <laughs> um, so let me know if there's anything that needs to be clarified at any point. Okay. All right. Third is the involuntary overworking. Ooh. Tough, right? So first step is ask yourself the question, do you wanna make the involuntary part voluntary? Do you wanna change the involuntary and make that into voluntary? Or is it a, really a situation that you cannot handle it? Like you really wanna change the overworking to working less. So decide which one you wanna do. You can do both, of course. But decide which one you it is is more important to you. Well, obviously, I'll tell you how to do both, right? So, if you want to change it to the to be voluntary, decide on your purpose. It's easy to say. Like everybody's like, whenever you tell anybody, if you're a lawyer and you tell somebody, "Oh my gosh, I'm having like such a hard time at my job," and Nine times out of 10, their response is just quit. <laughs> just quit. But they don't really have any context, right? They're just there for a YouTube event too. Because we know that it's not that easy. So, so before we throw in the towel, take a look at whether the situation is serving a purpose, a purpose that's meaningful to you. So if you're the only breadwinner in the family, the work that you're doing is heroic. You are creating money for those that you love. That is the purpose. And if your purpose is to learn as much as you can, maybe you're a junior attorney, then you're taking advantage of every minute to do just that. You're creating knowledge, lessons, experience for yourself. So think about how can you reframe what's going on so that it's working in your favor that you're, you're not being controlled by the circumstances so that you're creating all these resources and information and insights, which then leads to more opportunity for the next chapter of your life if you're working on that next chapter. And of course, involuntary overworking. Again, this is about if you want to work less, if you don't want to overwork anymore. Involuntary overworking is something that we shouldn't tolerate for long. Actually, let me rephrase that. It's something that we must not tolerate for long. Because again, when we tolerate what we do not want into our lives, we're perpetuating the idea that we don't deserve better. So if we are being the kind of person who is not burnt out, who's at peace, then we must know what we do not deserve is to be burnt out. So decide on your values. Is it your time and energy that is more important or is it others' time and energy that is more important. When you are being the kind of person that prioritizes their own time and energy and you start doing as that person, cutting out what doesn't serve you, then you start attracting, again, the kind of opportunities that serve you because you're no longer tolerating it and therefore opening up yourself to better opportunities. And you know, when I first heard this, I didn't believe it. I was like, okay, cut, cut all, the, all these uh, things and thoughts and beliefs that don't serve you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I really didn't believe it. But here's what happened. I have two examples for you. First is, so for my coaching business, for I had like a client for about almost two years and she was the only client that I had. And I, I knew that I was being underpaid, severely underpaid because she was with me since the, since the beginning of my business. And I just wasn't getting any more clients for the time that I was with her. And so I was thinking, I, I, 
my intuition is telling me that I need to let her go. I need to raise my prices. I really need to raise my prices, but I was so scared. What if I raise my prices, she leaves, and I don't have, have any more clients? But as I always say, listen to your intuition. Not your fears, but your intuition. And so when I did raise my prices, she left two weeks later in the same week with my raised prices, I got two more clients, two new clients. And that was a record number in two years. <laughs> when you release what is not serving you, then you get what you deserve, which is a lot, all good things. The second example is I had somebody that I was working with who was a coach. And again, my intuition was telling me, I don't know, like I, I, I learned a lot from this person. But I feel like my intuition is telling me I need to let this person go. I wasn't sure at the time. But when I did tell that person, you know, something is telling me, um, you know, I, I've learned so much from you. And I, I, I'm so thankful for everything that you've taught me. But I feel like it's time that we part ways. I just I'm not sure why. And the person said, that's a huge mistake. Don't listen to your intuition. Your intuition is crap. You're going to lose business. You're going to lose money. You're going to make less deals. And that's when I knew my intuition was right because my intuition was saying, don't surround yourself with people who put you down or make you feel small. And, and of course, the same week that I let that person go, there are a record number of clients, record number of deals. The type of deals that I've been asking that person to help me with, it wasn't happening for months. And the week that I let that person go, out of nowhere, it came to me. So there is a certain level of magic when you let go of things. And it doesn't have to be big, like quitting your job. It's about the beliefs. It starts from here. What are the kind of beliefs that are not serving you, that you need to stay in a relationship? that you need to work hard, that you need to do this and that doesn't align with you, that doesn't align with your intuition. What are those beliefs and how can we let that go? Of course. Finally, involuntary underworking. Okay, this one is exciting. Step one is get clear about your ambitions. Because if you feel like you're involuntarily underworking, this means that you have an unfulfilled ambition. And so be clear about what role do you see, in what role do you see yourself? In what position do you see yourself? And again, this applies not just to your career, but also to everything else. Get clear or who are you wanting to be because there is this disconnect right now between who you wanna be and where you're at right now. Be as specific as possible even if it might change later. Step number two, think about what are the actions that are consistent with those ambitions. Could be talking to industry leaders, could be talking to other uh, 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 lawyers in your department. And it could be going to conferences like this. And at first glance, it might feel scary, especially if you're not used to it, if it's something new that you have been putting off for a while. But I think it was Teddy Roosevelt that said this, that courage is not the absence of fear, but taking action despite the fear. And so it's okay to see that fear, observe that fear. That's your feelings, but what is your commitment? What is your commitment to those ambitions? And so follow the commitment so that you leave the noise of the fear behind you. And it helps also to be specific about what you already have. How can you make the situation work in your favor? Quick story. I, I watched this documentary a while ago and I forgot this, this, this guy who was this world-class baseball player. And the, the documentary person was like asking him, okay, how, how do you do this? Like, how can you be the best baseball player in the whole world? And he goes, every single thing that I do in my life, is to be the best baseball player in the world. What time I wake up, what I do after I wake up, how I brush my teeth, 
what I eat, who I hang out with, all of that stuff. So if you are being the kind of person who is successful in their role, you see the opportunity in everything. So you have, if you have extra time because you feel like you're underworking, that means that you can dedicate that time to redirect working towards that role. So tally up all the opportunities that you currently have. Maybe you can talk to the finance department if you're in-house. Maybe you can talk to other associates in different um, practice areas just to explore and to build your network. So what are the, what's the current access that you have? to the resources that are available outside what you've been explicitly told to do. Okay, final step, important, obvious but important. You have an infinite ability to create and maintain amazing relationships. So many times, too many times in the legal profession, we are scared to death. Like we're trained to be scared <laughs> about burning bridges, about, oh, you need, to, you need to be nice to other people because, um, because the, the legal world is small. And so you're like kind of trapped in this, in this sort of, like you have to do this zone. And so you feel like you have to be kind. You're forced to be kind. But if you, think, if you think about how this, is, this can actually work in your favor in an infinite way, you see infinite possibilities. And so here's how you do that. Think about how you can serve the other person on their terms. And this is a need, this is a universal need. Everybody wants to be seen, heard, and understood. No matter how grumpy they are, no matter how distant they feel, that is what they need. Whether it's by family, by colleagues, by friends, whoever. But again, it's important to serve them on their own terms. But think about who are you to them? Whether it's uh, an associate from a different department, whether it's uh, your GC, if you have a GC or whether it's your CEO, whoever, who are you to them and how can you best serve them? Obviously, if it's gonna be your boss, if you're talking about your boss, you're obviously not gonna be their friend. <laughs> you're gonna make them feel like a boss, be, make them feel like they're seen, heard and understood as a boss, right? And the way you can do that is by listening to any information that they have to offer and then empathizing with the stakes that they have, that they are managing. And so it can be something as simple as making eye, like uh, uh, relationships 101, right? Making eye contact, shaking their hand and being confident about it because leaders want to know that they have confident people in their team who are confident about themselves and confident about their work. And that's one example. Some leaders might, might not want that. And no one, remember this, no one can take away your ability to listen and empathize. There are so many things that you're able to do. Again, your infinite ability to create and maintain amazing relationships. No one can take that away from you. But here's the thing. If there are relationships that you feel like are irredeemable, then ask yourself, is this relationship worth having? Are you worth your relationships? And if you're like, no, it's not aligned with me. I don't think I deserve this. I don't think I deserve uh, uh, somebody who is toxic like this. Then you get to make that decision. All right. So we have the how. We know how to address every type of burnout. But you might be wondering, okay, that's a lot of information. What, what, what now? <laughs> and, and my biggest encouragement is to be focusing on the who more than the how. And this is the who, not how book by Dan Sullivan. And I'm going to talk more about that in a second here. I get a quote from his book, but these are the three questions that I want you to be asking. 
How have others done it before? Climbing up the ladder, the corporate ladder without burnout? Because it is possible. People have done that. The story that a lot of people want us to believe that that's not possible, but look for exceptions. And then ask, where are people doing it? Is there a group of people where it's like, um, it's not a bunch of lawyers who are like, oh my gosh, I hate, I hate being a lawyer. I, this is, this is crazy. I'm so burnt out. I don't want to deal with my burnout <laughs> and all of that. Are those the kind of people you want to be around with? And finally, who can help me do it? Who can help me do the things that I want to do? So who is in your team? First question, how have others done it before? It's one of my favorite quotes. Learn from the mistakes of others. You can't live long enough to make them all yourself. So find other people who have done what you want to do, crushing burnout, whether it is a mentor who's close. Oh, Stephanie, I see you raise your hand. I'm, I'm going to be done in a few minutes. I, I'd love to hear from you. So it could be a close mentor. It could be a uh, I don't know, the CEO, like Indira Nui, Nui I think. Um, she's the, the, the previous um, CEO of, of Pepsi, I think. Like, how does she overcome burnout? Is there a bi biography from her, right? Or athletes, or random, but they also experience burnout, right? Like, sometimes I just go to Wikipedia. I don't know if anybody can relate to this, but you just go to Wikipedia sometimes and you see like, okay, what do they do at this point in their lives? And the next question, where are people doing it? And James Clear is the author of Atomic Habits, if you have not yet heard of that book about habit building. And he says, join a community where your desired result is the norm. Your desired result is the norm. So AHLA is a great example. This is a community of people who want to be better healthcare lawyers because they know that they can always improve. Mom groups on Facebook group of people who like I, I, when I was so nauseous during my pregnancy, I was desperately searching for mom groups and they gave me so many answers. And finally, who can help me do it? It could be anybody, right? So here's Dan Sullivan from his book, Who, uh, Not How. It can be easy to focus on the how, especially for high achievers who want to control what they can control, which is themselves. It takes vulnerability and trust to expand your efforts and build a winning team. So your team could be anybody that you choose. It could be a therapist. I have a therapist. It could be your personal project manager. Lulu's my professional, uh, uh, I mean, not <laughs> project manager. And so they can, they're part of my, my team. And of course, my family is part of my team. I also have a coach. At one point, I have four coaches because I see the value in coaching. And so this is where I end. The, and uh, I'm just sharing my profile again because that's where I'm most active. And if you're like, okay, Angela, you're a life coach and I need you on my winning team and help me get unstuck, then find me on LinkedIn so that we can connect and see if we're the right fit. Okay. All right, we have exactly 10 minutes, which is perfect. So I'd love to see any questions in the chat or in the Q&A. I think I saw a Q&A there. And Stephanie, you uh, raised your hands, uh, hand by mistake. So. <laughs> so, so that's good. All right, so while I wait for a few people here, um, I'm gonna open up the first Q&A. I am okay with mistakes by me and others. I also do my best to project realistic expectations. How do I manage up with overlords who are unreasonable and have unreasonable expectations? Ooh, absolutely. Isn't that um, such a great question? <laughs> such a great question. And so let's take a look at the, hold on. Let's take a look at the quadrant again. So this is where you are involuntarily uh, overworking. So I think I was talk I talked about this after this question came in. And so it's a question of like, okay, what are your values? And how do you evaluate yourself? 
And so where are you at a place? Again, think about the purpose. If you are involuntary overworking, is there a purpose behind it? What purpose is it serving? Whether it's for your professional, uh, professional development. And I know that you might've reached a point where, oh my gosh, screw professional development. <laughs> I don't, I don't wanna do this anymore. And I understand exactly what you're saying. But think about, again, build a team. Build a team of people where you don't have to do this yourself. And search for other people that have actually done this and ask them, how did you manage it in my similar situation? Because you might be in a place where you might be in a setting that's a firm and you can ask other people who were in similar situations and how, how they dealt with it. And so create a community around you of people who are supporters. They don't have to be constantly cheering you on. It could be a person that you just simply ask, okay, can you give me, can you give me some pointers? <laughs> because I don't know how to deal with this. Um, so now the question is, okay, so how, like, should I leave or can I like, I, I don't know how to be honest with this person. I feel like they're being completely unreasonable. So again, we are always thinking about what is the, what is the right question? I mean, what is the right answer and how can I get it ASAP? So take the pressure off yourself about getting the right answer and getting the answer right away. Take that pressure off because when we're needing it right now, yesterday, then we're resisting it because we start stressing over what's not working and not looking at, okay, what are the opportunities that are out there? Okay. Okay, so because I have a few more questions, uh, anonymous attendee, please reach out to me. I would love to talk about this in depth so that I can understand your situation a little better. Uh, okay, you can't see your, see my screen. I don't think there is any, I think that that's the end of the slide. I was just looking at my quadrants for reference. Okay, do you have thoughts on working part-time as a solution to involuntary, involuntarily? overworking. If client demands are causing the involuntary overworking, will that work? Yeah. So, so this one is about, let me share. Okay. That's going to take a, take a while. In terms of, uh, again, I want you to think about like, I think involuntary overworking is a very common problem. And so go back to the question of, what is the purpose that is solving it? If you feel like there's absolutely no purpose, then I really want you to think about how is this, how is this aligned with who I am? Like, who do I really, really want to be? And when you're thinking about, I want to be the kind of person who actually gets to sleep at night, has less workload, and um, gets to spend time with family. And if that is the person that you're channeling and trying to step into, ask yourself, what would that person do? First thing they would do is know that they deserve it and know that it's possible. And when they know the possibility of that, then they start searching for opportunities that align with that. Instead of feeling stuck where we are and stressing about that. Now, I'm not gonna assume what you are doing or not doing. But I, what I want you to include, because I, I literally have like three lines from your questions. I don't know. Um, I don't know um, if I, if I, I don't want to make assumptions, but think about being that person and what would that person think? And then what would that person do? And again, it's okay if you don't have the answers right away. Really sit down make the time for yourself. Because if you are not giving yourself the time that you deserve, then how can you expect other people to give you the time that you deserve? So make sure that you do that for yourself and think about who do I really, really, really want to be? And how can I tell myself, I deserve this. And that doesn't mean I'm just going to tell off all the people who are being unreasonable. But if I am being confident in who I want to be, then you will start like being in stillness the answers come to you. And I know it sounds like woo-woo and a little bit crazy, but try it, okay? <clears throat> Next question here. Oh my goodness. Uh, oh, oh my gosh, five minutes uh, left here. Okay. 
uh, my biggest complaint lately is that I just feel disorganized. Like I'm too busy to get organized. Any pointers? Yes. So that um, I would say is resonates with uh, involuntarily underworking, right? So it's about, you know, I can organize myself. You know how to organize yourself, but you just kind of don't really want to do it. And so think about, again, like my example, right? And my exa example doesn't have to be your example. So think about where this originated. What happened at the time you started being disorganized? What happened? Write it down and take a moment. Again, when you put it out there, when you put all this gunk over here on paper, it becomes powerless. It doesn't keep coming at you and coming to you in your sleep while you're trying to sleep, while you're trying to meditate, while you're trying to work out, it doesn't keep attacking you. So put it down on paper and think about, okay, what happened around thereabouts the time that I start, started being disorganized? What are some of the beliefs that I have about disorganization? Does disorganization mean that I, I am disorganized? No. You being disorganized is just that you are making the choice to do that. So if you step out of the being, oh, I am disorganized and think about I'm making the choice to be disorganized, then you start thinking about, okay, this is not the decision I wanna make. Instead, who I wanna be is someone who is, dis who is organized. And when you really think about that, really think about being that person, you will start getting answers. Again, it's not gonna be immediate. It's not gonna be always right but you're the one who has the answers, who has the information that you're looking for. Okay, I, I know I feel bad because I'm not giving you straight answers, but I'm telling you uh, the answers are within you. And that's why I keep saying, have a star team because I get my answer. I, I excavate my own answers by talking to my coach, talking to my therapist, talking to my family, all of those things. And remember that you deserve answers and you get, you deserve it on your own terms. So if you're not quite ready to have your star team, that's okay too. And I want you to know that. Okay, uh, uh, is involuntary overworking caused by someone else or is it more internal? Oh, such a great question, Lori. I full heartedly, wholeheartedly believe that every single thing in our lives, we are 100% responsible for it. Even when I had depression, I have perinatal depression um, when I was pregnant. And one of my mentors actually, Dan Lukasik, he is very, very prominent in the mental health space as well. And he said, you can't blame yourself for your depression, but you are responsible for it. Because when we blame, we start just going down the rabbit hole. Like what's the cause? What's the cause? Who's to blame? And then it, that's not the direction that you go for solutions. But when you think about, okay, how can I be responsible for this? How can I uh, uh, be 100% responsible? Then you start looking for solutions. And then you're going in the direction where it actually gives you answers and not more stress. Um, which one of your podcast episode uh, talk about burnout? Oh my gosh, all of them. <laughs> not all of them, but a lot of them. Uh, and I think that all of them is ap applicable to burnout. And so like oh, the titles though themselves, they also have a lot of uh, clues on like what the episode is gonna be about. So scroll through them and see which one resonates with you. But thank you for asking about my podcast. I think somebody else asked about the recording. So I think it is being recorded. Um, so I would actually love to know that answer to that too. Oh, is it yes, I'm sorry. I typed back to the, the person who asked the question. We are recording it and our plan is to send it out to the membership next week. Oh, amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Valerie. Okay. Last question here. How do you set boundaries and avoid burnout when the firm culture dictates that you're available to superiors 24 seven and invariably gets to the point where I'm, that I'm so overwhelmed. I don't know where to start, which leads to me working longer hours due to procrastination. This, uh, this anonymous attendee uh, looks like a combination of a, of a couple boxes here, a couple of uh, quadrants here. There's the, uh, the involuntarily, involuntarily overworking and involuntarily underworking. So everything is involuntary. 
And so I know that you're looking for practical tips. Like, okay, what is the magic thing that I can say to my crazy bosses <laughs> that will make them see the light? And I wish I had that answer for you. But going back to what I was saying earlier about taking 100% responsibility, think about, again, going back to the be, do, have model. Who do you want to be? Do you want to be the person who is subject to the circumstances that are going on? Or do you want to be, do you want to be the person who takes control? And if you do want to be the kind of person who takes control and is responsible for every result that happens, what does that person do? And because, because uh, we have such limited time, I can't get into all of that, but I, I, I guarantee you, when you sit down with this, give yourself the space. Even if when you're sitting in the bathroom, I do it, I do it when I'm sitting in the bathroom. Think about, okay, like literally stare into space and in the stillness, in the quiet, think what comes to you. What is your intuition picking up on? What is it telling you? Because it tells you, okay, this is the level of discomfort that you can bear for a little bit, but this is a kind of pain that you just should not be tolerating. And when you make that decision, then you start thinking about, okay, what are ways that I can ask for help the right way so that I can communicate in a way that makes sense for everybody involved? Because when you make a decision that is right for you, as hard as it is to believe it, you're making a decision that is right for everybody else. Because when you're happy, everybody else is happy, the right people. So think about that. Think about how when you're making decisions for yourself, it's not just about you anymore. Being selfish is actually selfless. Okay, again, I know you want the right answers and you want it right away, but I'm giving you the hard task of doing that yourself. We are three minutes over time and uh, awesome, awesome, awesome. Yes, so, so thank you so much for, uh, for everybody who attended. And um, please, again, please contact me, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I would love to talk to you, please, <laughs> because you deserve answers. If you're looking for them, they will find you, okay? Thank you guys. Thank you, Angela. We appreciate it. This is oh, great. Yeah, five, yeah, five o'clock, there will be the networking hour. I'll be there for the first half hour. See you there. Perfect. Bye. Thanks, Angela. Take care, Bye. everyone.